Psalm 9, part 2. You recall we uh, took a dive into this last week. We got about, oh, verse 4 or 5, something like that. Um, so we want to go back and reset the context again. As I looked at this psalm and chewed on and I hope you're doing the same thing, and, and I hope you do that not just for the teachings on Sunday morning, but when you do that for your own personal Bible study, um, whether it's your Bible study time or it's your devotional time or, or whatever, or maybe you combine the two, that you're really taking the time to chew on what the passage has to say. Don't just, and I know a lot of folks that do this, but let me encourage you to, to change course a little bit. Instead of having, and this is popular, you know, you have a daily reading where you're, maybe you're on a one-year cycle reading the Bible through in a year or something like that. And, and, and that's all well and good. I would encourage you to do that. I, I read five chapters of Psalms every day and a, and, a, and, a, and a proverb in addition to some other devotional reading. And it's easy to do that. If you do that, by the way, if you read five chapters of Psalms and a proverb every day, guess what? You can cycle through the entire book of Psalms and the entire book of Proverbs in a month. There's 150 Psalms, right? So if you read five a day, you'll cover the whole book of Psalms once a month. And then, of course, the last day of the month, if it doesn't have 31 days, you're going to have to read um, an extra proverb. But the point is that you can get through that on a rapid pace and, and think of where you would be in a year's time if you've read the book of Psalms 12 times. Wow. Talk about adding some depth to your walk with the Lord. Um, but anyway... I encourage you to take some time to chew on the Word as you're reading it. Understand, first of all, and you folks have been around here a long time, many of you, and so you understand the first thing that when you approach a passage of Scripture, you're going to read it in what? It starts with a C, context. You're going to read it in context. We get in trouble when we read things out of context. And false teachers thrive on that very practice. They can make a passage of Scripture say whatever they want it to if they wrest it from context. And many do. They use it to advance their own agendas. So stay in context when you're studying. That's one of the major points you're going to see as we work our way through Psalm 9 this morning is that we're going to read in context. And in fact, as I close today, if we have time to do this, uh, that's one of the closing points, is that we need to pray in context. We need to pray in context. And I'll explain what that means in, in a little bit. But Psalm 9 deals with our expectations of our great God. And as I was chewing on this passage... I saw David, or I see David, making his case that we can always expect God to meet our expectations. We can always expect God to meet our expectations. Now, some of you may be thinking, and rightly so, well, but what if my expectations are this, or this, or this, or this, or this? Does that mean God's going to meet all those? No, here's the key. The key to God meeting your expectations is that you have a right view of who God is. And when we pray, we are to pray according to what? The will of the Father. Jesus prayed according to the will of the Father. We are to follow that example. We pray according to the will of the Father, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. So when our desires, our expectations line up with what God wants to give us, guess what happens? Answers to prayer. Answers to prayer. And so part of our spiritual life is focused on understanding what God wants for us. What is God saying to you about your spiritual life? What is he saying to you about your walk? What is he saying to you about the ministry that he's trying to plug you into? And if your answer is nothing, my response is, when was the last time you asked him? 
Well, and have you asked him again since then? What are you saying, Mike? I'm saying that God has a plan for every one of you. Every son and daughter has a purpose and a plan in the kingdom. I've made this point numerous times over the years. Nobody has to sit on the bench. You understand if you're a bench player, a part-time player, that's your choice? You've made that choice. That's not God's desire. We all get to play on the varsity team. And that's a wonderful thing. Every one of us have giftings and callings, the scripture says, that God gives to us for the purpose of being used in the life of the body. Do you get that? So what is your calling and what is your gifting? And where is God calling you to use that in the larger life of the body? Expectations met. Now, one of the things that he starts off with, David, he, in this ninth psalm, is praise. Notice verse 1. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. Two, I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So he starts off with praise, with worship. Now, this is a carryover, really, and I pointed this out last week. This is a carryover from verse, or Psalm 8, verses 1 and 9. Look at those verses. 8, 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. And then verse 9 of Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So David is in this mode, in this context of praise, in this context of worship. And that carries over, it seems, into Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord. This is a determined lifestyle. How many of you have ever, maybe you're there this morning, how many of you have ever had a day where you didn't really feel like praising God? Oh, come on, you can be honest. You just struggle. Maybe some of you are there this morning. You're just struggling, and having a heart for worship seems like a burden. Well, there's good news, and it's this, in part. Part of being able to praise the Lord and live a life that is characterized by praising God is, are you ready? Here's your million dollar information. If you don't get anything else out of this morning, get this. A large part of that lifestyle of praise, a life that is characterized by worshiping the Lord, resides right here. It's attitude. It's attitude. Let me emphasize that again. It's up to you. Will you live a life that is honoring to God, that gives glory to Him, that is characterized by joy, or will you live a life that's essentially controlled by your circumstances? Now, we're not meant to live a life that's characterized by our circumstances. We have to guard against allowing those circumstances to reach those tentacles into our minds and our hearts. Because what happens when we allow circumstances to get their mitts on us? It just sours us, doesn't it? Sours our outlook, sours our perspective, sours our attitude. And then that becomes manifest in what? Our behavior. So we need to cut that stuff off. We need to reject that, or as some of my brothers and sisters and other flavors of the kingdom, we need to rebuke that. <laughs> we need to reject that. We need to deny our enemy access to our heart and to our minds. And that's a choice that we make, right? Because greater is he that is in us than, great, than he that is in the world. When we allow the enemy in, it's because we've made the choice to do that. And so we need to reject that. 
And so David starts with this attitude of praise, but the thing I want you to see about this is that he has determined that that will characterize his life. Now, what are some ways that are going to help us to have that attitude? Well, he says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. With all my heart. That's complete devotion. That is undivided attention. That is not sharing my heart, my devotion, not giving any other thing. That same space that is reserved for God. Only the Lord occupies that space. Not our jobs, not our children, and don't be elbowing anybody, but not even our spouses. Complete devotion to the Lord in all things characterizes a lifestyle of praise. So I will give thanks to the Lord, the determined lifestyle. And by the way, you see the list there, don't you? Determined lifestyle is number one. I will give thanks to the Lord. Secondly, with all my heart. So that's complete devotion. Thirdly, that leads inevitably to this. When you have that attitude, you can't keep it in. So he says next, I will tell of all your wonders. When you are full of joy. Well, Jesus said this, didn't he? He says, I will so fill you with my spirit that out of you will come what? Rivers. Roaring rivers, currents of what? Living water. You won't be able to hold the joy in, but it'll be all over your face. People will ask, what is up with you? I am walking in the spirit and the joy of the Lord today, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Praise God. And you'll be an asset in people's lives. You know, when you live a life of praise and worship, people begin to seek you out so they can get some face time with you. Now, that's pretty cool when you think about it. Well, what's the flip side of that? Well, when you walk around with this sour face that looks like you've been baptized in lemon juice, the world will try to avoid you. They don't want to spend any time with you because you're a downer. I used to tell my kids this when they were young. Make sure you choose your friends wisely and make sure that they are what? Two of them are here this morning. They can probably tell you. Make sure you pick balcony people as opposed to basement people. Why balcony people? Because they lift you up. They encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Basement people, on the other hand, they pull you down into the same muck that they are in. So be very careful about who you allow in your life because if you want to know why your life's a mess, one way you can figure that out is to look around at the company you keep. You will reflect the attitudes and the behaviors of the people you surround yourself with. So you don't need to look up into the sky and say, why me, Lord? Why is this happening? Because the answer is going to be, well, look at the company you keep. Or, as I'm fond of saying, this is a paraphrase, when you run with dogs, you get fleas. Now, now Paul said it the same way, only he said this, bad company corrupts good morals. It's a fact. And we try to justify our choices of friends and our choices of behaviors, but the truth is they will impact who you are. They will impact your attitude. They will impact your outlook and your perspective. So he says, I will determine that as a lifestyle, I will give thanks. I will give complete devotion with all my heart. And as a result of that, I am going to tell everybody I meet about this great God that I serve. I will tell of all your wonders. What's the easiest way to do that? To talk about what God's been doing in your life. To talk about the wonderful things he's done in your life. Let me tell you what God did for me today. You won't believe it. I love telling people stories like that. Next, verse 2, as a result of this, a determined lifestyle, complete devotion, and testifying to God's wonders, I will be glad. How, 
how many of you understand that you cannot put a price tag on peace of mind? How priceless is peace? Contentment. Just being still and enjoying where you are at in the Lord, in your relationship. I think that is a very valuable and often overlooked blessing that God wants us to have. We live in a, in, a, in a time, brothers and sisters, that it just seems like we are crazy busy, constantly busy, running here, running there. Now, I thought it would slow down for me when all my kids were grown and gone and had families of their own. Well, guess what? I had a rude awakening. But I think it's, I'm at the point in my life for a reason because the things that God has me doing now would have been impossible to do when my kids were younger. And my plate was full then, they'll tell you. But the things that are going on now, there's no way I could do that and raise kids. God's timing. But I am at a place of peace with where I am and the things that he's doing in my life and the life of this fellowship, what I see him doing in your lives. It's an amazing time to be a part of Calvary Chapel of Lima. These are the times, brothers and sisters, that we're going to look back and reminisce and say, do you remember when? Do you remember when? And we've been through some stuff, haven't we? We've been through some stuff recently that it's, that it's really tested our mettle, hasn't it? It's tried us. Are you who you say you are? Do you depend on the Lord that you proclaim in all things? Not just when it's going well, but when it's going bad. Do you still depend on Him? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we've been proven in that. So this settled peace he talks about here. I will be glad and I will exalt in you. We recognize the source of that, don't we? We recognize where that peace comes from. Now, we have the peace of God because of salvation, right? We have peace with God by our relationship with him. So I will be glad and I will exalt in you. And then finally, I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And I shared this at the prison last week. We talked about this in the context of um, Psalm 8. In that first verse, notice it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. And then here in Psalm 9, he says, I will sing praise to your name. Anytime that you run across that in the scriptures, brothers and sisters, when it talks about praising his name, giving glory to his name, you need to understand that what's being said here is that we are praising God for his characteristics. We are praising God for his attributes. Now, God is known by many different names, right? I would encourage you to do a, a study on the names of God. And what you'll find out is that all the names of God in the scriptures are directly tied back to an incident where he ministered to someone or a group of people. And so he became known by that situation, Jehovah Jireh. For example, Jehovah Jireh means what? The Lord, my provider. Where did that come from? Abraham offering Isaac. You remember? Isaac said, Dad, see the altar? I see the wood for the altar, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, what? God will provide a sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh. So his name, when you run across that in your study, you're praising him for his characteristics. Now, you are praising him for his characteristics, most especially as he has revealed them to you personally. So what does that say to us right here? Well, that says to us there at the end of verse 2, I will praise your name. It's talking about a personal experiential relationship. How many of you understand that God has made us to experience Him? 
He's, he's not some, excuse me, he's not some abstract concept or idea out there that it's really hard to wrap your mind around and figure out. No, no. God is personal in the sense that he wants to relate to you exactly where you're at. He wants to reveal himself in tangent ways that meet your concerns and needs and prayers. He's a real living God that you can relate to based on your experiences with him. When we have that same understanding with one another, don't we? We have relationships either within our family, within our church family. We know people that we can count on. We know characteristics about people. We know people that are dependable in certain areas or have certain things that, that they do. Well, God wants you to understand him in the same way. You can depend on him. You can trust in him. You can count on him. You can call on him. It's a relationship that's being talked about here. So he says in verse 3, because of that, because of this life of praise, when trouble comes. Now, I like it that it says when and not if. Because <laughs> some of our brethren, other flavors of believers, they've been, well, let me be frank this morning. They've been lied to. They've been lied to. Some of our brethren are sitting under teachers that are telling them, you should never encounter troubles or trials in your life because if you do, it's because you've done something wrong or, or you don't have enough faith to overcome that. Well, there's a Greek word that applies to that particular theology, and it's called balogna. Some <laughs> we pronounce it baloney. That's simply not true. Read the book of Job. Man was created for trouble. <laughs> trouble characterizes our life brothers and sisters. And so our energy should not be spent trying to circumvent life or that's all you'll ever get done. But instead, trusting God to see you through all of these things. You see, God doesn't allow those things to come into your life and then abandon you. He allows them to come into your life for a number of reasons, but one of the things that he's going to do, guaranteed, every time, because the Word says so, not because I'm telling you it's guaranteed every time, but because the Word says so, every time those trials come, if you'll trust him through the trial, he will use it for good. Now, I'm not going to pretend to understand how some of the things that happen in people's lives can be used for good. Only God knows his mind completely and how he's going to do that. I'll trust his word that what he says is true and in time it will come to pass. Now I've had those aha moments before, have you? That weeks, months, sometimes years after the fact it's manifested and revealed and why you went through this and what you learned from that that maybe you didn't even know until the time that, boom, the light bulb went on. Now I know why he did that. I've had those moments. Maybe you have too. But God will use those. So notice he says, when my enemies turn back. That's a very encouraging statement, don't you think? How many of you feel like you're being oppressed by the enemy? Even today, yeah, the enemy is sorely pressing against you. It might be a health issue. It might be a relational issue. It might be a financial issue. But the enemy presses against us. When he does that, brothers and sisters, in your life, when the enemy presses in against you, here's what I want you to do. Lean hard 
into Jesus. When the enemy comes against you, don't try and fight him, but lean hard into Jesus. Trust what Jesus says and does in his word, because notice here, David, by experience, says, when my enemies turn back, so he says, I know you're going to have victory, Lord. In all of these situations, when my enemy comes against me, and by the way, when I say my enemy, on the surface it looks like people, right? Don't you just love people? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> I know there are times when you just want to put your hand right on their face and just shake their head. You know. <laughs> Am I the only one that... Because <laughs> I have that a lot. <laughs> At times like that, it's good to remember people are pawns. And I've been chewing on something... I'm probably going to write a blog post about this, and I even have the title. Now, if you're a blogger, don't steal it. Or I'll say the title, the original. <laughs> Pawns and knights, which are you? I've been chewing on this idea as a result of, of this. You see... Our enemy will use people just like pawns on a chessboard. The tragedy of that is that people are, that are being used by the enemy, they don't even know it in many cases. They're being moved around by the enemy. Now, they think, and I even know some folks, they're pawns of the enemy, and they actually think they're doing a service to the Lord. All you need to do is look at the fruit. What is the fruit that that so-called ministry produces? Is it rotten fruit? Is it division? Is it murmuring? Is it backbiting? Is it gossip? Well, guess what? That's not of the kingdom. They're pawns. Instead of being a pawn, be a knight. Be that soldier in armor, ready to stand firm for the kingdom. It's a picture that we need to remember always because when we come up against folks that we just want to shake their face, remember that they're being manipulated. Just like a pawn. And that helps us in a number of ways. Primarily, it helps us not to take offense because that is a bait of the enemy. The enemy wants us to take the bait of offense because what that does is then that disrupts relationships. That gets us to a place where we're holding things in our heart that do not belong there. And it obscures the fact that our Warfare, our battle, is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. See, behind those people that are pawns is the enemy. It's the hand of the enemy moving them. And they may claim that they're doing it for the kingdom. Check the fruit. And we are to be fruit inspectors, right? And that's all a part of the judging that we're to do. We are to discern and we are to judge between one and another, whether or not it's accurate. So when our enemies turn back, that's understanding and claiming victory. We know that God's going to do it, right? God will defeat our enemies. So when they turn back, they stumble and perish before you. I like pointing out to people in a, in, a, in a kind and gracious way that no one is going to stand before God and say, you're wrong. <laughs> 
no one is going to stand before God and plead their case. And in fact, when we get down into this, well, if I don't move, we're not going to get there. But when we get, well, let me just move and then we'll get there. Now I can talk about it. That'd be the best thing to do. So when our enemies turn back, when, not if they turn back. So the victory of God in our lives and on our behalf is certain. When our enemies turn back, God will prevail for us and through us every time, guaranteed. They stumble and perish. So our enemies, all of those that are opposed to the kingdom, they will be judged. Judgment is coming, brothers and sisters. The day is coming. I believe it's soon. I think the coming of Jesus is soon. Because we live... Now, it's been this way in other parts of the world. It's come home to roost in America. Now, this isn't news to any of you who have been around here a while. I've said this for years. But I think that the speed of it, the speed of the evil is increasing in America today. And I don't know what you think about this, but I look at the present landscape, political landscape of America, and I'm thinking, these folks are insane. but they are insanely evil. We are getting set up, brothers and sisters. We, America, this nation. My own personal view is a lot of things are already in place. All you got to do is pull the pin and it's going to all blow up. Now, I don't say that to scare anybody. I say that to take heart Because the Bible, I believe, my interpretation of this is that when those days come, when you see, Jesus said you should be able to see and know the season you live in. Wise is the son or daughter that is able to see what's going on with spiritual eyes and not be fooled and deceived. But when I say that things are are wickedly evil, and that we're being set up, and that we're very close, we should take heart in that because we should know that the soon return of Jesus is at hand. He says in verse 4, that you have maintained my just cause. Now, I explained this last week, so I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but our just cause is a righteous life, a life of holiness lived for him. God will fight on your behalf and He will defend your name as you live for the kingdom. But sometimes when we don't live that life, guess what's going to happen? God's not going to defend someone who brings reproach upon His name. Now, He's not going to let you be destroyed, but you are going to be judged. How many of you understand that as a believer, God will, many times does, discipline you when you leave the path? You cannot just ignore God and sin indiscriminately and then expect Him to just wink at it because, well, you're a son or you're a daughter, so we'll just, we'll just let that go. God doesn't let anything go, especially when it has to do with His sons and daughters. God's going to deal with things. So He will, he will maintain our just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. Now, I like the verb tenses here in verses 4 and 5. You notice they're past tense. You have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. That's taking a look ahead. But it's also saying this. This is a specific kind of of prophecy, if you will. A prophecy that's uttered as if it has already come to pass. God is certain to act in certain ways, even though he hasn't yet. That's a now and not yet aspect of the kingdom of God. There are certain things that are so sure they will come to pass. God has said he will do these things that we can speak of them as if they've already taken place. The prophet Isaiah does that in many, many instances. 
But notice how he treats all of those who are against his kingdom. He rebukes them. Now, I like the flow of it here. Notice that warning comes before judgment. He rebukes them first, then he judges or destroys. And as a result of that judging and destroying, notice that it says that their names are blotted out forever and ever. How ironic, don't you think? That the wicked and the evil who try to make a name for themselves, and that's what America is all about today, 300 million people trying to make a name for themselves. And when you try to make a name for yourself by opposing the kingdom, are you listening, atheists and agnostics and secularists and all those God-haters? When you try to make a name for yourself at the expense of God's name, you will be destroyed. And your name, the name you try to elevate above the name of God, will be blotted out and remembered no more. That's an amazing thing, don't you think? That people could be so deceived that they would try to lift themselves up above the God who created them. God says, I got news for you. It's your name that's going to be blotted out. The enemy, verse 6, has come to an end in perpetual ruins and you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. I talked to some of the guys in our Thursday night Bible study. I said, you know, that's an interesting statement. The very memory of them has perished. I wonder if that doesn't have direct implications upon our life in heaven and what we will and will not know. Because it's a fact. We have family members that die without Christ. And someone has asked, I've heard this question asked many, many times, well, will I know that they're in hell? Will I know? Well, here's my answer. Two parts. One, I don't know. Two, if I were to answer that to the best of my knowledge, I would say no. And in part, based on passages just like this, the very memory of the wicked is perished. Heaven is a place of joy. It's not a place of tears. Heaven is a place of worshiping God, not looking back into the past or worrying about what we had on earth and what is not there in heaven. But that's my view. You may hold a different one and that's fine because if we disagree on this point, it's not going to keep either one of us out of heaven. Right? I have to remind people of that occasionally because they get all huffy and puffy and say, well, that's fine. You can hold a different opinion than I do. That's okay. It doesn't offend me in the least. It has nothing to do with our salvation. Verse 7, but the Lord abides forever. Now, how interesting the contrast. Those that try to make a name for themselves elevate their names above God's. He says, I will destroy and their names will not be remembered. And yet my name abides forever. Of course it does. He is God. He has established his throne for judgment. Boy, there's an interesting topic. You want to talk about judgment today? you're going to encounter one or two responses. A very interested person, they want to hear, what are you talking about? Tell me more about this. Or they're going to say, you're nuts and God is not like that. Now, I really like the opening when people say, well, my God is not like that. <laughs> now, you should seize on that when people say that to you, brothers and sisters. Well, my God when so no, 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 wait a minute. God is the God of everyone, right? It's not your personal God. Because you know what that is? My God. That's an idol, right? You've constructed this idea of God to fit what you think. Take what you think and lay it over as a template on the scriptures and then see if it lines up. If it doesn't line up, guess what? The word's not changing. You need to change. God's name abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. Now, here's an idea that is derived from that. He's established his throne for judgment. He has not established his throne to hear a defense of the lost. 
Nobody's going to argue their case for why, even though they rejected God in life, they should still be, enter, be able to enter into the kingdom of God. God's not hearing that. He is going to hear one statement composed of three words from every lost person. You ready? You can write this down. This is what he is going to hear. And it will be on bowed knee and bowed head. And they will say this just before they're consigned to hell. Ready? Got your pens ready? Okay, I'm joking. Jesus is Lord. That's the total statement from the lost when they come before God, the great white throne judgment. Jesus is Lord. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Listen, if you make that confession in space and time, you will see eternity with God. If you reject that and the Creator, what's going to happen is that when you enter into eternity, He will consign you. Depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. So He has established His throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness he will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. Hmm. Guess which standard God's going to use to judge? His. <laughs> His. Aren't you glad? We live still in America for all of its warts and for as bad as it is, we still live in a land that has the best. And as soon as I say that, it makes me cringe because I think, wow, man, if it's the best, can you imagine how bad it is in some other places? But it's still the best. But it's still a far cry because our judicial system, brothers and sisters, has been turned on its head. It is so twisted and convoluted today. You're very, very fortunate if you get a righteous judgment out of our judicial system today. Now, it's been that way in America historically for uh, particular groups of people. They've not had justice from our judicial system. We're seeing the backlash for some of that today. America, our lawmakers and our Judges, those that are involved in that whole process, they are up to their eyeballs in blood. And God will hold them accountable. Every one of those lawmakers and judges that look down their noses at us on the issue of abortion, they're going to be judged. Abortion today is the modern day equivalent. In fact, it is nothing more than the Old Testament practice of sacrificing to idols. Now, the idol today is sex. That's where it started. Well, we don't want to be burdened down with children. We want to continue to enjoy our sexual pleasures, but we don't want to be burdened down with the consequences of that. So we just destroy this. But behind that idol of sex is what? Demons. Satan, our great enemy. The same thing goes for a whole host of other things. America has become overrun. And this is something in the last couple of years that I've become more aware of. But America has become overrun as a place for sex trafficking. In this particular area that we live in, West Central Ohio, is one of the hot spots in the nation for that activity. God's going to judge those people. Judgment is coming, but God will judge by His standards, and He will judge equitably. So finally, fairness in the judicial system, because 
God's standard is used. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, all those who uphold his standard. Listen, the Christian community in America, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about your hobby horse Christians or your Disneyland Christians or your cotton candy Christians. I'm not talking about Christians that, that their so-called testimony or faith is about a quarter inch deep and about 10 miles wide. I'm talking about Christians who are really born again and living it. I'm not talking about a social Christianity that, well, this is what we do. I go to church to network with other people because I have a business. I'm not talking about that kind of Christianity. I'm talking about the real Christianity that names Jesus Christ as Lord, that is trusted in the finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross and His shed blood to forgive us of our sins and to grant us eternal life. That's the Christianity I'm talking about. It is increasingly coming under oppression in America today. And if you don't believe that, you better open your eyes. We are being constantly and systematically marginalized. Laws are being passed to silence our voice. We live in very dark times in America. Never seen this before in the history of our nation. And brothers and sisters, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Why do I say that? Well, you're downing me out, Mike. No, I'm telling you this so you'll open your eyes and start living your life accordingly. I'm telling you this so that you can understand the context in which we live in America today and do something about it. Now, are we going to, my, my personal opinion is, we're not going to overcome this because I think we're headed in a specific direction for a specific reason. And you can study Revelation on your own, or better yet, go out and get the teachings. They're out there. This world is headed towards a point in time where judgment's coming. History has a purpose, right? It isn't just going to go on and on forever. Man is not on this ascent to perfection. We're actually on a descent. Judgment's coming. That's what David is, a, is talking about here. But he says, in the midst of this environment, in the midst of this context, the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. That's us, brothers and sisters. A stronghold in times of trouble. That's now, right now. He is a stronghold for you. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. So in other words, those, remember, again, when it talks about his name, you have a relational, experiential relationship with him. You know him by experience. So all those who know him by experience, in other words, those who are saved, those who are born again, they will trust in you regardless of the trials or the troubles that you find yourself in. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. How easy it is when we get into the midst of trials to just kind of drop everything and kind of get depressed and just give up. But God says, listen, no. Know that I am your strength and your stronghold. I will uphold you. And when those troubles come, don't look away, but look intently into my eyes and we'll get through this. God wants to get you through the troubles that you find yourself in. But if you're distracted by them and you wander off, then he's got to bring you back before any of that can happen. Pay attention when trouble comes. Why does trouble come anyway? Well, part of the reason is it's a distraction. Right? If you're on the straight and narrow, brothers and sisters, and you got all this static on the sidelines as you're journeying in this life of faith, and every so often you've got this static over here, what's, it, what's that about? Well, that's trying to pull you off the path. That's trying to divert your attention. It's trying to get you to stop, get off the path, and get involved in this. It's really a waste of time. It's a strategy of the enemy. For sure. But God says that he does not forsake us. Verse 11. So as a result of this understanding that God will never forsake us, those who are saved, those who place their trust in him, verse 10, a result of that is that we can sing praises to the Lord. We will give him joy. 
He will bring joy to us, but we will sing with joy and praises. Declare among the peoples his deeds through our testimonies. And I believe that right up until the day he raptures us out of here, that we should be testifying to God's goodness. Now, when we're gone, brothers and sisters, there will be people that he will raise up to continue that. The Bible says that there will be 144,000 people specifically with the ministry of sharing the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. So the work's going to continue, but as long as we're here, we need to be doing that, right? For he who requires blood remembers them. So get the, the, the picture here, brothers and sisters. Verse 10 talks about those who place their trust in him, he will not forsake. And the reason that we are assured by that is verse 9, because the days are coming when we will be oppressed, and yet he will be our stronghold in those times of trouble. So we will sing praises to him. We will continue to testify to him in the midst of our troubles. And this is what God is doing on our behalf. For he who requires blood... Now, I don't think that it's a stretch here to see in that the truth of the atonement. Nobody makes themselves right with God by their own merit. Do you understand that? You can't do stuff by which God will say, oh, you know what? That's really good work, and I think that you've done enough, and I'm just going to let... No, 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 no. It's by the blood of Jesus, right? It's by placing your faith that Christ's sacrifice on your behalf satisfies God's wrath against sin. Every man, woman, child that has ever been born has been born under the penalty of sin and death, or the penalty of sin, which is death, right? And the only way that that penalty is paid is by trusting in the blood of Jesus. And what is the, what is the proof of that? Well, are you living life as a disciple of the Lord Jesus? Are you? That's the proof. And so because of that, then, he says, for he who requires blood, so a blood relationship, remembers them, us, the oppressed. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted, all of those who place their trust in Jesus, he's talking about. Be gracious to me, O Lord, see my affliction, from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death. Yeah. It's Christ that saves. We cannot save ourselves. That I may tell of all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, and when it talks about gates, understand the context. Gates in the Old Testament had to do with the public meeting places, right? It's where the elders gathered. It's where judgments happened. They held court. So when it talks about gates, you're, de you're declaring your testimony and your love for God publicly. And that's consistent with the testimony theme that we're seeing in these verses. So that I may tell of all your praises that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. How wonderful and how valuable is a joyful witness to the world. The nations have sunk down. Look at what happens to all those who shake their fist at God. The day is coming. Nations and peoples and governments think that they are making a convincing argument that we don't need God, but look at the result, look at the end, look at what's going to transpire. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made. Do you understand that when you reject God, you've got no place else to turn? So they will sink down into the pit which they have made in the net which they hid and their own foot has been caught. The wicked cannot boast in God's salvation and nor do they want to. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his hands, the wicked is snared. So there's more than enough evidence out there to believe. But the wicked as Jesus said in the New Testament, he point blank told a whole group of people, he says, the reason that you don't believe is because you don't want to believe. You just don't want to believe. 
Now he says here, notice there's, it's an interesting ending to verse 16, Higion Selah, Higion Selah. And that carries the idea that, now pause and consider these words. Meditate upon them, chew on them, and think about the implications of these words. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. So again, the day's coming when God will deal with evil. Arise, O man, do not let man prevail. Huh. Wow. How many of you have ever uttered that prayer? Lord, let not my enemies prevail over me. When you are sorely pressed, this is a prayer that God will answer. Do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. And I pray that this happens. I pray this happens. Let the nations know that they are but men. We are on a course. The world has fallen into this deception that we are able to fix and solve all of our problems. In America, because we have wealth, the mindset is this, we'll just throw money at it and money will fix it. How many of you know that money doesn't fix anything? If you have a problem, now I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't know, Mike, money could fix a few of my problems right now. Well, what I'm saying is this. <laughs> it's just like the alcoholic that thinks, well, my next beer, that'll just drown out all my problems or the drug addict, the same concept. Money will buy you lots of things, that's for sure, materially. But money cannot satisfy the heart. You may be satisfied in things, but that's a whole different thing. The things will leave you empty. Things only have value and I like to use this example. Many of you bought a brand new vehicle, and I use this with young people a lot. You, you buy a brand new vehicle, man, that thing is the apple of your eye till the payments come. And then after about the fourth or fifth payment on that thing, you're thinking, and I got three years of this, or four years of this, or whatever. Well, I've heard some horror stories out there about the, the prices of vehicles. People are financing those things for seven and eight years now. Can you believe that? That is amazing to me. But people think that they can solve their problems, and they think money will solve it. It won't solve it. So this is a prayer here where David is saying, God, let the nations know that they are but men. That's an interesting statement. He's saying, help them to understand that you are the only one that has the answers to the things that trouble them. Let nations and governments understand that they can come up with all these laws and all these plans and all these things to try and address issues, but unless they turn to you and hear from you, they don't have an answer that's going to last. They don't have an answer that's going to address our greatest needs as people. And that's the context in which we live in today, brothers and sisters. So let me give you these in closing. Let me give you these three points, and you can go back and study this on your own, and I'll try to hit these quickly. Psalm 9 calls our attention to these three points, and you may see other things, but as a summary as we're coming to God and as we're living a life of, of uh, worship, as that characterizes our lifestyle, I think that you saw in this psalm many instances of prayer, many instances of crying out to the Lord to rise up on our behalf. 
And so as we think about Psalm 9, three points. Let's remember to pray in remembrance. Now, let me give you this. This is verses 1 through 12. You can look at this on your own time. These are for your own personal devotion. Pray in remembrance. That's verses 1 through 12. And really what David showed us here is that he recognized what he had been through. Verses 1 through 6. He recognized where it was headed. Verses 7 through 8. And then he recognized what he could count on. Verses 9 through 12. So pray in remembrance, brothers and sisters. That's the point. Second point, pray in context. Pray in context. Verses 13 through 18. After David recounted or remembered God's past goodness and his favor toward him in verses 1 through 12, he also petitioned God for his present or current situation. How many of you know that life has its ups and downs? And just as soon as you get through one thing, you think, okay, I got smooth sailing now. Well, maybe you do for a while. Then how many of you know that trouble is going to come again? Don't turn a blind eye to it or you'll get knocked over, right? Because trouble happens all the time. It's just part of our existence here on earth. Some of it's by our own doing. Some of it's we're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Some of it's we're guilty by association. It's other people that bring it into our lives. There's a whole bunch of different things. But when we pray, pray in context. And here's the thing I like to remind people. Because you have a track record with God, because you have a relationship with God, you can depend on His past mercies and His past favor for your present situation. Because God was faithful then, you know He'll be faithful now. So pray in context and then finally pray in anticipation. And that's verses 19 and 20. Nations and governments have historically and even his increasingly today oppressed and treated God's people violently. That's not going to change. It's my opinion that it's going to get worse. Too many examples to go into. But history is coming to a close. Now, I know. You're saying, okay, Mike, go ahead and break out your aluminum foil beanie and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> Believe me, I know what most people think when you start talking about the return of Christ. There are going to be a lot of believers that are going to be very, very surprised. We must be aware of what's going on. There are people that the Lord wants to save before he raptures the church. I want to be a part of that harvest. I want to be faithful to make sure we concentrate on the word and that we're doing what the Lord would have us to do. And we don't need multi-million dollar facilities to do all that. All we need is a heart for the Lord because he will direct our footsteps right and what is nearer and dearer to the Lord's heart than those whom he desires to be saved he has people right here in Lima Ohio they're not in the kingdom yet but he wants them he's calling them into the kingdom I want to be a part of that this radio station that just launched yesterday is going to be a huge huge resource in doing that. So one of the things I'm excited about that is it's 24-7 Bible teaching. No psychobabble. No music. You know one of the things that aggravates me, and now this is just a commentary. This isn't part of the teaching, but this is just a commentary. One of the things that frustrates me is when I do have a music station on, which is rarely, and I'm not going to name any, when I do have a music station on and, and they do those little blurps where they, they broadcast one of their callers that comes in and they say stupid stuff like, oh, I don't know what I would do without the music in my life. It just uplifts me and encourages me and I would be lost and I would just like, read the word. 
you got all day to listen to music. Are you reading the Word? Music doesn't save you. And if your life is saved because you listen to a music station, your life's a mess. And you need to be in the Word. But that's just me. You may think something else when you hear that on the radio. It drives me nuts, though. Boop. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I thought somebody was raising their hand back there. <laughs> anyway, we've got work to do. We have much work to do, brothers and sisters. Christianity, <laughs> the church, I just feel like we're living in some kind of twilight zone. People think the church is supposed to be some kind of Disneyland thing. But it isn't. Do you know the church is supposed to intentionally station itself at the gates of hell and stand out there and scream and holler for anyone passing by not to go any further? That's the mission of the church. Proclaim Jesus Christ to the lost and the perishing. Now, that means we're going to look like something particular and specific. Let's pray about that. Shall we? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and mercy toward us, for your kindness and your faithfulness. Thank you for these words in Psalm 9 that we studied this morning. Father, I pray that you would continue to bless us, Lord, with an understanding heart and mind. And then, Lord, equip us to stand in this present time so that we can be everything that you desire for us to be. Lord, rescue the perishing. Save those that are lost. Allow us to see that fruit, Lord. Bless these people, Father, your people, with everything that they have need of. Lord, would you bind our hearts and our minds together that we may be of one accord moving forward, Lord, for the kingdom. We love you, Father. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen.